So let's continue on in our study of tissues by taking a deeper look into the characteristics and functions of epithelial tissue first. What are the defining characteristics of epithelial tissue? And what does epithelial tissue do? How do the cells of epithelial tissue interact and communicate with one another? There are many more questions we could ask about epithelial tissue. We will probably need two separate lessons to explore those. But for now, let's start with these important questions about epithelial tissues. We all engage with epithelial tissue every day because the outer layers of our skin are made of epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue includes epithelia and glands. Epithelia, the singular of the word epithelium, are layers of cells that cover not only external surfaces, as in our skin, but also internal surfaces of hollow organs. For example, the inner lining of the chamber of our heart or of our lungs. Glands, on the other hand, are composed of fluid secreting cells which are derived from epithelia during development. So to our first question, what are the defining characteristics of epithelial tissue? Let's consider five. First, epithelial tissues display cellularity. Cellularity simply means that they are composed of cells. Really, when we emphasize the cellularity of epithelial tissues, we mean that relative to some other tissue types, they display a higher level of cellularity. Epithelial tissues have cells that are closely bound together without much material in between their cells. And that's actually not something we can say about all tissue types. Some tissue, for example, connective tissue, is quite distinct in this regard. We will see with connective tissue that there is an abundance of material separating neighboring cells from one another. Second, epithelial tissues display polarity. Polarity simply means, in this context, that the cells are rarely symmetrical, either in shape and or in their surface components and therefore functions. That is to say that their cells often have distinct ends or distinct poles, hence the word polarity. Whether the epithelial tissue is one cell layer thick or multiple layers thick, there is at least one surface that is exposed to the external environment, or depending on where the epithelial tissue is in the body, lining the inner hollow chambers of an organ. The free surface exposed to the external environment, or the inner hollow chamber, is referred to as the apical surface because it's at the apex of the cell. Three, epithelial tissues are attached to an underlying connective tissue layer via a basement membrane. We will learn more about the characteristics of the basement membrane in our lessons on the integumentary system. We will discuss the basement membrane a little later in this lesson, but I'll leave a fuller description for a future lesson. Four, epithelial tissues are avascular. The prefix a from the Greek means negation or without. That is to say epithelial tissues lack or are without vascularity or blood vessels. To be precise, blood vessels do not run into epithelial tissues. The avascularity of epithelial tissues is quite distinct from other tissue types, such as connective tissue, which are highly vascular. Because they are avascular, epithelia must get their nutrients from blood vessels found in deeper supporting connective tissues, or by absorbing them through their exposed apical membranes. Fifth, and finally, epithelial tissues are highly proliferative. That is to say they contain cells that are capable of division. For this reason, epithelial tissues are able to regenerate and repair themselves when damaged or when cells are lost from their surfaces. The proliferative capacity of epithelial tissues is quite distinct from some other tissues. Muscle cells, for example, and neural cells, and some connective tissue cells display very low proliferative capacity. Thus, epithelial tissues have these five defining characteristics. Now let's move on to our next question. What do epithelial tissues do? Epithelial tissues perform a number of distinct functions depending on their location in the body, but here are four essential functions. One, they provide physical protection. Two, they control permeability. Three, they provide sensation. And four, they produce specialized secretions. First, epithelial tissues provide physical protection. Because they're exposed to external surfaces and internal chambers, 
Epithelia protect these exposed surfaces from friction or abrasion, from dehydration and destruction by chemical or biological agents. The protective role is clearly evident with the surface layers of your skin, which resists impacts and scrapes, restricts water loss, and prevents bacteria from invading into your body. Second, epithelial tissues control permeability. Any substance that enters or leaves the body must cross an epithelium, whether that is water moving through the epithelia of your skin or a nutrient being absorbed across the lining of your small intestines. Some epithelia are relatively impermeable, while others are easily crossed by compounds even as large as proteins. Third, epithelial tissues provide sensation. Not only do some nerve endings penetrate into epithelial tissues, but epithelial tissue also contains specialized cells that can detect changes in the environment and relay information about such changes to the nervous system. For example, touch receptors in the deepest layers of the epithelium of the skin respond to touch by stimulating neighboring sensory nerves. And fourth, epithelial tissues produce specialized secretions. We call epithelial cells that produce secretions glandular cells. Sometimes these cells are individual cells that are scattered among other cell types in an epithelium. An epithelium with many such cells is described as a glandular epithelium, in which most or all of the cells actively produce secretions. We can further classify these secretions in a number of ways. We will explore the classifications of glandular epithelia in more details in our discussions of the integumentary system and the endocrine system. But for now, these secretions are broadly classified according to where they are discharged. Exocrine secretions are discharged onto the surface of the epithelium. Examples include enzymes that enter the digestive tract or perspiration on the skin and milk produced by mammary glands. Endocrine secretions, on the other hand, are released into the surrounding tissue or interstitial between the cells, fluid, and blood. These secretions, called hormones, act as chemical messengers and regulate or coordinate the activities of other tissues, organs, and organ systems. We'll talk more about these in Module 10 on the endocrine system. Endocrine secretions are produced in such organs as the pancreas, the thyroid, anterior pituitary, hypothalamus, adrenal gland, and elsewhere. Our remaining question in this lesson on epithelial tissue is a very important question. How do the cells of epithelial tissues interact and communicate with one another? In order to carry out their numerous functions, such as their protective roles and roles in regulating permeability, epithelial cells need to remain firmly attached not only to the supporting tissues beneath them, but also to one another to form a complete covering or lining. If an epithelium is damaged or the connections are broken, then it no longer can serve as an effective barrier. For example, when the epithelium of the skin is damaged by a burn or abrasion, bacteria can enter underlying tissues and cause an infection. Undamaged epithelia form effective protective and permeability barriers because of intercellular connections between the cells of the epithelium. These intercellular connections involve either large areas of neighboring plasma membranes or specialized connection sites. The large areas of neighboring plasma membranes are interconnected by transmembrane proteins. We call these cell adhesion molecules. These proteins bind to each other and the extracellular material by a thin layer of proteoglycans. These are proteins that are modified with sugars attached to them. More specialized attachment sites that attach a cell to another cell or to extracellular material are called cell junctions. There are three common types of cell junctions, tight junctions, gap junctions, and desmosomes. We begin with tight junctions. At a tight junction, the lipid layers of adjacent plasma membranes are stitched together by interlocking membrane proteins. Just inferior to tight junctions, there is a continuous belt within the cells. It forms a band that encircles the interior of the cell membrane and helps bind the cells to their neighbors. The bands are connected to a network of actin filaments which are a major component of the cytoskeleton. Tight junctions prevent the passage of water and chemicals dissolved in water from flowing between neighboring cells. These junctions are common between epithelial cells exposed to harsh chemicals or powerful enzymes. For example, tight junctions between epithelial cells lining the digestive tract keep digestive enzymes, stomach acids, or waste products from damaging underlying tissues. A second type of junction between epithelial cells 
that helps anchor them to one another are desmosomes. Most epithelial cells are subject to mechanical or physical stresses such as stretching, bending, twisting, or compression. So for this reason, they must have durable interconnections. At a desmosome, the plasma membrane of two cells are locked together by cell adhesion molecules and proteoglycans between the opposite dense areas of each cell. Each dense area is linked to the internal cytoskeleton by a network of protein filaments called intermediate filaments, a very stable form of cytoskeletal protein. Desmosomes that form a small disc are sometimes colloquially called spot desmosomes. Desmosomes are abundant between cells in the superficial layers of the skin. As a result, damaged skin cells are usually lost in sheets rather than individual cells. That's why your skin peels after a sunburn rather than just coming off in individual cells like a powder of sorts. Hemidesmosomes resemble spot desmosomes in that the same proteins are involved, but they reach out from the basal surface of an epithelial cell. And because the basal surface connects to the basement membrane and not a neighboring cell, there is no partner to form a complete spot desmosome. Therefore, there is really only half of a desmosome, the half that is anchored in the basal membrane of the epithelial cell, which then reaches out and grabs onto components of the basement membrane inferior to the cell. We call these hemidesmosomes for that reason. Not only do cells of epithelial tissues need to hold on to one another for structural support, but they also need to communicate with one another. Doing so would allow them to share important chemical resources and to coordinate their internal activities. Some epithelial functions require rapid intercellular communication. At a gap junction, two cells are held together by embedded membrane proteins, which are called connexons, because they're made of clusters of a protein called connexin. Together, the connexons form a narrow passageway or tunnel that lets small molecules and ions pass from the cytoplasm of one cell through the connexon into the cytoplasm of the neighboring cell. Gap junctions are most abundant in tissues like cardiac muscle tissue and smooth muscle tissue, where they're essential to coordinate the muscle contraction of the tissue as a whole. They also interconnect cells, especially in ciliated epithelia, to help coordinate the movements of the cilia. Back to our discussion of epithelial cells as displaying polarity. Recall, polarity simply means that the surface of epithelial cells may be very distinct in structure and function. The surface exposed to the external world or to the hollow chambers of an organ may be quite distinct from the surfaces attached to the basement membrane. The apical surface of epithelial cells is exposed to the external environment or to that inner hollow chamber. The surface of these cells often have specialized structures, unlike other body cells. For example, many epithelia that line internal passageways have small foldings of their exposed surfaces. We call these microvilli. Microvilli may vary in number from just a few to so many that to look at the tissue as a whole, they seem to carpet the entire tissue surface. They are particularly abundant on epithelial surfaces where absorption and or secretion commonly take place, such as portions of the small intestines and kidneys. The epithelial cells in these locations are specialists at transporting substances across the membrane, either absorbing chemicals or secreting chemicals or both. The microvilli, in particular, increase the surface area of these tissues. A cell with microvilli has at least 20 times the surface area of a cell without them. The greater the surface area of the plasma membrane, the more transport proteins are exposed to the extracellular environment. Structures that are very similar in appearance, but quite distinct from microvilli, not only in structure and function, are cilia, motile cilia. Motile cilia are characteristic of surfaces that are covered by a ciliated epithelium. A typical ciliated cell has roughly 200 to 300 cilia that can beat in a coordinated manner to move material, not through the cells, but along the surface of the cells. For example, the ciliated epithelium that line the respiratory tract moves mucus-trapped irritants and bacteria away up from the lungs toward the pharynx or the throat. On the opposite side of epithelial cells from the apical surface, the epithelial cells attach to a basement membrane. 
Epithelial cells not only must adhere to each other laterally, but also must remain firmly connected to the rest of the body. This function is performed by the basement membrane, which lies between the epithelium and the underlying connective tissue. There are no cells within the basement membrane. It consists of a network of protein fibers. The epithelial cells adjacent to the basement membrane are firmly attached to these protein fibers via their hemidesmosomes. In addition to providing strength and resisting distortion, the basement membrane also acts as a barrier. It restricts proteins and other large molecules from moving from the underlying connective tissue into the epithelium and vice versa. Finally, in relation to their high proliferative capacity, an epithelium must continually repair and renew itself. Epithelial cells may survive for just a day or two because they're lost or they're destroyed or damaged by exposure to disruptive enzymes, toxic chemicals, pathogenic microorganisms, or mechanical abrasion. The only way the epithelium can maintain its structure over time is through continuous division of unspecialized or undifferentiated cells, which are stem cells or germinative cells. These cells are found in the deepest layer of the epithelium near the basement membrane. So in summary, epithelial tissue is characterized by closely bound cells, a free surface exposed to the environment or internal space, attachment to underlying connective tissues by a basement membrane, avascularity, and continual replacement of exposed cells. Epithelial tissue provide protection, control permeability, provide sensation, and produce specialized secretions. Epithelial cells join to one another via tight junctions and desmosomes and communicate with one another via gap junctions. The presence of microvilli on the free surface of epithelial cells greatly increases the surface area for absorption or secretion, while motile cilia function to move materials over the surface of epithelial cells. Join me in our next lesson as we consider how epithelial tissues are classified.